Shalom, and welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean, your host. It is Wednesday, January 9th, 2019. I'm still getting, still trying to get used to the 2019. The website is www.scriptureandprophecy.com. And today is our uh, study in the Gospels, the Gospel portion, I should say. Um, which we follow, we're following the gospel portion that can be found on TorahPortions.org. And uh, I've explained many times what the Torah portions are, um, but if you're curious, uh, you can visit that website and find out all about it. Uh, but we're following the gospel portion. Um, and today our portion is John chapter 19, verse 31 through 37. Only six verses. And uh, But then we're going to uh, continue our study also in the book of Acts. And we're ready for chapter 4 in the book of Acts today. So that is, that is what we're getting into uh, this morning. Uh, by the way, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who has uh, been supporting the podcast and, and just helping me make these things possible. Uh, just thank you so much uh, for all you've done. And uh, if you're interested in supporting the podcast, you want to uh, help it grow, help it continue, you can pray for it, um, pray for its success, pray for its protection, and um, you can also become a Patreon partner uh, by going to scriptureandprophecy.com and clicking on the Donate and Support tab uh, there at the top or on the sidebar. All right. Let's have a look here. John chapter 19, verse 31 through 37. It's uh, the portion dealing with the piercing of Christ on the cross. King James Bible. Let's begin. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high Sabbath day. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers to break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. So the first thing I like to do here is point out the scriptures that John is referring to um, in the Old Testament. For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled, that a bone of him shall not be pierced or shall not be broken. And uh, he is referring to uh, the Psalms, where that's where all the seems like all the mis, uh, the, the the prophecies about the Messiah are there. And so let me just give you three psalms here that kind of talk about this uh, situation, the crucifix crucifixion. Uh, we have Psalm twenty two fourteen. It says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. You have Psalm thirty four twenty. He keepeth all of his bones, not one of them is broken. That's what John's referring to. 35.10 says, All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivereth the poor from him that is too strong for him, yea, the poor and the needy for him that spoileth him. And then he says again, The scriptures say, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. Psalm 22, verse 16 through 17, For the dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, They've pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. 
Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And then, of course, you have Revelation chapter 7, or chapter 1. Now, obviously, this isn't a prophecy before this. This is a prophecy after this. It says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. All right, the last thing I want to point out and uh, it's not to get into a debate or an argument, but it's important to note that when, in this very first verse, it says, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. Now, obviously, he wasn't crucified on Sunday. The Sabbath day that it's referring to, a high Sabbath day, it's usually dealing with a um, feast, a Moedim. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away, because they can't, they can't do any work on a high Sabbath day either. Now, some argue, and they make good points, that Christ probably wasn't crucified on Friday because you have a hard time getting three days, three full days out of... Friday to Sunday, right? And that's that's a good argument. All you have to do is be able to do some basic math, and that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to argue about what day exactly it was. Um, the only thing I think is important to note is uh, that the High Sabbath is referring to a feast day. And it's important to note because the feast days point to the Savior. They point to the Messiah. Their purpose is, uh, I think, more than anything, are to show you Messiah. And things happen on those days. And so, let me just read, I'm going to read this real quickly, because I don't want to waste too much more time. I'm just going to read this real fast out of the Chronological Gospels. I'm going to read a little paragraph of commentary uh, out of the Chronological Gospels now. I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with the with the days. Uh, that's not the point that I that I want you to, to grab. I just want you to grab the high the concept that it's the high Sabbath, that it's a feast day, you know, because Christ was the Passover Lamb. All right, here's what it says. Let me just read those seven verses again, real quick, or six verses. But I'll read it out of here. It says, because it was the preparation and the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was a high day. The religious leaders besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and took the legs of the first one and of the other, which was crucified with Yeshua. But when they came to Yeshua, they saw that he was dead already, and they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. By the way, I should note that there's some manuscripts out there, and I don't know if they're accurate or not. Um, and I don't know a lot about them, but I just think it's interesting. There's some stories out there, written stories. Um, they could be bogus, but they talk about how when that, sol that soldier had a blindness in one eye, and when he pierced Christ, the blood got in his eye, and he was healed, and he became a believer. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But that's uh, I've heard that legend before. Uh, verse 35. He who saw it with his own eyes is the one who bears witness, and his witness is true. He speaks the truth about what he saw, and that is why you can believe him. These things were done so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture says, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Let me read the short commentary again. Uh, short commentary for you again. I'm not saying that he's right about the day that Christ was crucified. 
the only point we're trying to make is that it was a that it was definitely a feast day here. Okay, here's what he says. He says each of the feast days begin and end with a high Sabbath, regardless of the day of week, the day of the week. John clearly specifies that this is the day of preparation, that the day of preparation precedes the high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which began at sundown on Wednesday that year. He had already stated that the Pharisees refused to go into Pilate's judgment hall that morning because they did not want to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. Only through gross ignorance of the Feast of Yahovah could these could this stated high Sabbath be mistaken for a regular weekly Sabbath. The casual reader, unlearned in Torah, the schoolmaster that leads us to Messiah, according to Galatians 3.24, assumes that any mention of the Sabbath is always referring to the seventh day of the week. However, every feast of Yehovah begins with, the con- and begins with and concludes with a high Sabbath, regardless of the day of the week upon which it falls. The high Sabbath will fall at sundown, Nearing the end of Wednesday, the Passover lambs were crucified. Or I mean, Passover, well, that's true, too. What I just said there is actually true. The Passover lamb was crucified. Uh, but what he actually says is the Passover lambs were sacrificed on Wednesday that year. And so was Yeshua. So there's some food for thought uh, on that. All right. We've got limited time, so let's move on. And we're going to read... Acts chapter 4, and it's just something I've just been doing the last four weeks, uh, because the gospel portions are so, are so short, uh, but because of the time restraints, I don't have a lot of time to do a bunch of commentary, uh, we're more or less just reading it, and, uh, and I'll give some thoughts uh, as we go along if I have time here. So let's look at Acts chapter 4. And they spake unto the people, the priest, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. All right, remember, it was in in chapter 3, they had just healed a guy who had been laying there for like 40 years or something um, and gave him the, the ability to walk. And they healed him in the name of Jesus. And so now the religious leaders who were not really interested in God or the truth or God's Messiah, they're more interested in their uh, religious and political power and position. They're grieved that they see these people preaching in the name of Jesus. Verse 3, And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. How be it? Many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Ananias the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and many as were in the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power? Or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, Even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head cornerstone. And of course, he's referring to Psalm 118.22. Might as well just take a glance at that real quick. Psalm 118.22 and 23 says this, The stone which which the builders refuse has become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118, verse 22 and 23. Peter, Peter, when, when you look reading through Acts, when Peter's given the sermons and he's saying these things and he's standing before uh, you know, the religious leaders, he goes to the scriptures a lot. 
and uses the scripture, which is what you're supposed. This is how you. That's how you preach. You don't preach by quoting your favorite author, or you know, you do a whole message, and then you use one scripture to back up your message. No, you quote the scriptures over and over and over to prove your points, as Peter, by example, does, even when he's just defending his actions. Verse twelve. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven which among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they, ref- they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But it is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. So you see, they're not interested in the truth. Or in the, or in God. Look here, they, they, they're even, they're even admitting. They're saying, to themselves out loud, well, we can't deny the fact that they actually did heal this guy in the name of Jesus, and we're worried that this is going to continue to go forth and it's going to damage our, you know, our religion, our reputation, our power. We got to put a stop to it. Verse seventeen or verse eighteen, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all the men glorified God which, for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Last week I made the point, you know, sometimes in our lives we wonder why are we in this situation? Here this man is over 40 years old. He's sat at this gate every day. Probably thought to himself a few times, why me? And this great miracle happens and he's healed. And because of this thing that was done for him and with him, you know, many people believed and praised God. God had a purpose for this man. And again, we, we know, you may be asking similar questions. And there may be a day that comes when that, an, when that answer, when that answer is, is available to you. And you'll see, oh man. All this time I was murmuring and God had this amazing plan let's continue uh, for God for the man was about 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed verse 23 and being let go they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them and when they had heard that they had lifted up when they had heard that they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said Lord thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and all that in them is and by the mouth of the servant David has said why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing he's referring to Psalm 2 the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for of truth against thy holy children for of truth against thy holy child Jesus and thou has anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whosoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants thy with all boldness that they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thy hand to, be, to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, they played, when they had prayed, the place was shaken 
where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. In other words, they shared all their possessions. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and the distribution was made unto every man according to as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of the constellation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And that, my friends, is chapter 4 of the book of Acts, alongside our gospel portion for this morning. And I pray in the powerful name of Jesus that it's blessed you. Thank you for joining me for this study. Thank you for supporting the podcast. Thank you for your prayers. And uh, that's all I have for you this morning. Peace and grace be with all of you. Until next time. God bless.